Hello, my friend. Thank you for joining us today. I'm so glad you're here. I really am. I pray these next few minutes that we'll spend together will be life impacting. I pray that God will speak to your heart and meet you at the point of your need. Do in you what you cannot do for yourself. So thank you for joining us. If you have your Bible nearby, turn with me to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 14, and we're going to read verses 8 through 11. John chapter 14 and verses 8 through 11. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. I want to talk to you for the next few minutes on, on the subject of, of our hearts and our hearts in communion with God, how to have an intimate heart, a heart that's intimate in relationship with God. You know, that brings up the question, is it possible, is it possible to live in constant contact and communion with God? Is that possible? In other words, is it possible to live in such a way that in every moment of every day, we sense his presence? Well, if we look at the life of Jesus, we can see the answer to that question. Yes, it is possible. Jesus enjoyed unbroken fellowship and communion with his Father. The relationship between Jesus and his Father was very, very intimate and mutually fulfilling. Jesus said that he only did what he saw the Father doing. He didn't do anything of his own deal. He only did what he saw the Father doing, and he only said what he heard the Father saying. In verse 19 of chapter 5 of John, it says, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does. Then in verse 30 of that same chapter 5 in John, I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge. So everywhere that Jesus went, he repeated what he heard his father saying, and he did what he saw his father doing. If his father got louder, he got louder. If his father took action, he took action. He was so synchronized in his heart with his father that he was able to openly declare that he and his father were one. We're one. In John chapter 14 and verse 11, it says, I am in the Father and the Father in me. That's intimacy. That's that unbroken communion with God. It is possible to live in such a way that we can sense his presence every minute of the day. Now, God desires the same level of in intimacy, that same abiding intimacy with us that he had with his son, Jesus. Now, if we're going to be like Jesus, if we're going to have a heart like his, we're going to have to learn how to have that same level of relationship with God. So how do we do it? How can we learn to pray with intimacy? Well, let's start here. We pray our relationship. We pray our relationship. Let me explain. We talk to God at the level that we walk with God. Here again, we talk to God at the level that we walk to God. It is true in all areas of our, of our life and the human experience. The level in which we talk to one another is determined by the relationship that exists between us. For example, strangers talk about the weather and other trivial things. Partners, they talk about business. Acquaintances, while well, they talk about friends they have in common and, and events that they enjoy and, and might even have in common on their schedule. And friends, 
talk about their problems and their feelings and a host of other things. So we pray our relationship. We talk to God at the level that we walk with God. Now, if we only pray to God to get help and provision, then an intimate relationship is not that important. If all we want is God to help us and give us, then having an intimate, ongoing, unbroken fellowship and communion with God, it's not that big a deal. It's not that important. And here's the problem with that. We see God as a vending machine God, kind of the holy vending machine. In other words, we don't see him as our loving father, nor do we see him as our abiding forever friend. We see him as a holy vending machine. Well, you know how vending machines operate. When you want something, you punch in the right numbers, and what you want drops into the tray. You take it out, and you leave. You walk away from the vending machine. You have no relationship with that vending machine other than when you want something or need something, you punch in the numbers, and you get it. A lot of people treat God that way. They only come to him when they want his help or they want him to step into something. They want him to give them something. That's the only time they ever come. So spiritually speaking, they punch in the numbers and they get what they have asked for. Then they walk away. They don't come back until they need something else or want something else. That's how we, how many people treat God like a vending machine. They have no ongoing, abiding, intimate relationship with him. Now, that's going to be a problem. We're never going to develop intimacy with God if that's how we treat God. We pray, I said it a moment ago, we pray our relationship. We pray according to how we walk with God. We talk to God how we walk with God. So we need to do something. We need to change how we see prayer. We need to change how we see it. We need to see the Lord is our shepherd and we're his sheep. Let's start there. The Lord is our shepherd and we are his sheep. He leads, we follow. He provides and protects and we trust him. And think of it this way also, my friend. We have the privilege, and it's a privilege, of praying in the intimacy of a father-child relationship. The privilege of praying in the intimacy of a father-child relationship. In John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God the children of God. See, as a child of God, we live every day in the security of our Father's wisdom, provision, and love. That is the ultimate security. We live in the security of our Father's wisdom, provision, and his abiding and never-changing love. Therefore, because we do, we can pray at a level of intimacy that no one outside of the family circle will ever experience. If they're not a Christian, they will never experience that level of intimacy with God. They're outside of the family circle. But as a child of God, we have that privilege to pray in that security of a father-child relationship. Now, let's face this part. We will never uh, pursue more of God until we become dissatisfied with our current relationship with God. Let me say that again. We'll never pursue more of God until we become dissatisfied with our current relationship with God. Listen, God's not obligated to quench a spiritual thirst or satisfy a spiritual hunger that doesn't exist. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. In other words, God has obligated himself to answer the cry of anyone who's thirsty for more of him. He's obligated himself to satisfy the hunger in the heart of anyone that wants more of him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So we'll never pursue more of God until we become dissatisfied 
with our current relationship with God, that level of relationship. Let's, let's face it, no one is at that point where they don't need more of God. No one, I don't care who you are, no one is at that place in life where they don't need more of God. So, and here's another thing we've got to deal with. You will only find God, you're only going to find him when you pursue him with your whole heart. When your heart's in it, in your pursuit of him. You know, it's not that, that people don't pursue God. Uh, people all over the world, they're in pursuit of God. They pursue him, but not with their heart. Their heart's not in it. It's just another to-do th list thing that they can check off. Well, I pursued God today. I did my prayers. I read my Bible. Check it off. You can't find him. He's, he's going to say that to us. You cannot find God unless your heart is in it. Listen, Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13. It says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So my friend, your quest to pursue God, if your heart's not in it, you're not going to connect. You're not going to find him. But if your heart is in it, you will find him and find the help that you need. And, and here's why your heart has to be in it. Because that's the only thing God really wants from you. The only thing he really wants is your heart. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking, well, God wants my time. He wants my money. He wants my talents. He wants my. Uh, he wants me to go to a foreign field and do missions work. He wants me to be more faithful in my church attendance. He wants me to pray a little bit longer and and put a little more diligence in my Bible reading. Uh, those are all good things, but that's not ultimately what God wants from you, my friend. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. Because he knows if he ever gets your heart, he'll have all the rest of you and everything about you. He wants your heart. And you'll find God, he said, when you pursue him with your heart. So in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26, it says, listen, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. Give me your heart. You know, when your heart is in your pursuit of God, it'll be a delight to you. You'll enjoy the journey. If your heart's not in it, you'll dread it. It's just another thing that you got to get done to keep in good relationship. At least that's what we think. But if your heart is in it, it'll become a delightful journey, a delightful pursuit. So I think in order to deepen our relationship with God, to learn how to become more intimate and stay in that constant unbroken communion and fellowship with God, we need to understand the dynamics of our relationship with God, our, our relationship with God. You know, if, if we were asked, tell us to and explain the relationship that a Christian has with God. Well, we would probably say something like, uh, well, Christians go to church on Sunday. And Christians pray and read their Bible every day, or at least try to. And, and Christians try to live by the precepts and the principles that are taught in the Bible and how they apply to their everyday life. That's how we would describe it. But God doesn't describe his relationship to us in those same terms. See, we divide our life into a sacred compartment and a secular compartment. We have sacred, secular. God doesn't. Every single area of life is sacred to God. And because we do that, we describe our relationship with God in terms of activities. I go to church. I read my Bible. I pray. I try to live as I should. I try. I do. I go. That's activities. But listen how God describes his relationship with us. He describes it in terms of intimacy, in terms of intimacy. So let's look at a few of the examples from Scripture of how God defines his relationship with us. The first one is he sees us as the vine, which is him, and the branch, which is us, the vine and the branch. 
in John chapter 15, verse 5, and then verse 7, Jesus said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. That's what Jesus said. So in other words, God desires for us to be as close to him as a branch is to the vine. Now, the branch is literally an extension of the vine. And the branch doesn't separate out and then come running back to connect with the vine when the season of bearing fruit comes around. Vine doesn't do that. The vine stays, I mean, the branch stays constantly connected to the vine. There's never a moment when that vine is separated from the branch and the branch from the vine. So that's how God sees us. And as a branch, always connected to the vine, we continually draw spiritual nutrition from God, the vine. Let me give you another one. The temple, the temple, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? In Solomon's temple in the Old Testament, God was not an occasional visitor. He was a permanent resident. And the same is true today. See, God doesn't show up at, at church service and when the service is over, turn around and go back home. God doesn't do that. And here's why. Because we are the church now. We are the church and God is indwelling us as believers, as the church. He never, ever goes back. He never, ever walks away. He goes with us wherever we go. And he's with us in whatever we do. We're the church and he resides in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you have the vine and the branch and you have the temple. Here's a third one, marriage. God sees our relationship with him in terms of, of marriage. Revelation chapter 19 and verse seven says, rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. That's us. You know, when you think about successful marriages, they thrive on intimacy that transcends a physical relationship. They thrive on an intimacy that's way beyond the physical relationship. And successful marriages, they openly communicate. They communicate their feelings, their ideas, their opinions with each other. And, and you know it's true. You've seen it. The longer people live together in that level of intimacy, the more they think, act, and speak alike. That's the relationship of intimacy. That's what it'll do. It'll bring the gap that are between the two closer to being absolutely one. This is true of our relationship with God. This is how he sees it. The more intimate we are with him, the more yielded we're going to be to his will. The more intimate we are with him, we're, the more yielded we're going to be to his will. The more time we spend like him, the more like him we'll become. We'll take on his nature. We'll adopt his principles and we'll model his attributes. So we have the vine and branch. We have the temple. We have marriage. Here's, let me give you a fourth one. The shepherd and his sheep. The shepherd and his sheep in Psalm 100, verse 3, it says, We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Whenever you see a flock of sheep, rest assured, my friend, there's a shepherd nearby. There's a shepherd nearby. And that shepherd is committed to lead and feed and protect his sheep. The same is true of Jesus in our relationship with him. He's committed to lead and feed and protect us. And he will never let us out of his sight. Never. He will never let us out of his sight. Psalm 23 verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, how fear no evil, for you are with me. My friend, whatever you're going through, the Lord's with you. I don't care how horrible it is, how difficult it is, how painful it is. The Lord's with you. He's your shepherd, and he's committed to lead you and feed you and protect you, and he's never going to take his eyes off of you. 
So if we look at those examples, according to Scripture, God describes his relationship with us in the following terms. He is as connected to us as a vine is to a branch. He's as present with us as he was in the temple. He's as intimate with us as a husband and a wife are with each other. He's as devoted to us as a shepherd is to his sheep. So living in unbroken communion with God, if you look at the scripture, that's always been his plan. That's always been intent. It's never been the exception to the rule. It's always been his intent that we live in unbroken fellowship and communion with him. David described his intimate relationship with God. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 10, David said, Oh, Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. There is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You've hedged me behind and before, and you've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. That's intimacy. That's that unbroken communion and fellowship that God desires. And David was experiencing that. And then if you read the Apostle Paul's writings, he pleaded with people over and over and over again to live in unbroken communion with God. Stay connected. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean that you stay on your knees 24 hours a day praying. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about as you go through the daily routine of your life, through the busyness of your schedule, stay connected. Pray without ceasing. Romans chapter 12 and verse 12 says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Stay connected. Stay in that unbroken communion and fellowship with God. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, Paul said, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Praying always. Praying always. So how do we do that? Given our schedules, how do we do that? If God desires unbroken fellowship and communion with us, how in the world can we do that with our busy schedules? How do we do it? Well, let me give you some practical steps that we can all take that'll help us what I call practice God's presence every minute of the day. Here's some practical steps. Number one, give God your first thoughts of the day. Give God your first thoughts of the day. And you know what, my friend? It may be nothing more than thank you for a good night's rest and for keeping me safe. I'm yours today. Give him your first thoughts of the day. Psalm chapter 5 and verse 3 says, My voice you shall hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning I'll direct it to you, and I will look up. First thoughts of the morning, give them, give them to God. And then step two is give God your idle thoughts. You know, when you're in between the busyness, those idle times, give God your idle thoughts. Understand, your awareness of God is a fruit of your stillness before God. Let me say that again. Your awareness of God is a fruit of your stillness before God. I encourage you, Paul's encouraging you, learn to be still in the presence of God and listen. And listen, you don't have to do all the talking. Prayer's a, a two-way communication. We sort of send text messages and emails, and, and, and then we, we go about our business. We don't give God time to answer. Learn to sit still in his presence and listen for his voice. Psalm 46 and verse 10 says, Be still. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Let me talk to you, God is saying to us. So give God the first thoughts of your day. 
And then give God your idle thoughts. Learn to be still and listen. And, and the third step we can take is give God your busy thoughts. Give him your busy thought, thoughts. You know, when you're at your busiest moment of the day, you're not going to be able to just bow your head and stop and go off somewhere and pray. You won't be able to do it. Your schedule won't allow for that. So we need to learn the value of brief sentence prayers. Through our busiest moments of the day, Lord, what do you want me to do in this situation? That's a prayer. Lord, help me. I need help with this. That's a prayer. Lord, speak through me to this person. That, that's a prayer. Lord, I love you. And thank you for loving me. Those little short one-sentence prayers, we can offer them in the busiest moments of our day. You've done that. I know you have. We've all done that. We've been in a situation and we didn't have time to really pull off and pray. So we, Lord, help me. Lord, guide me. I need your wisdom in this matter. Those short one sentence prayers, give those in to God in your busy thoughts, in your busy time. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. We talked about that a moment ago. You can't do that unless you learn the value of these short sentence prayers, little brief prayers. And then the last one, give God the last thoughts of your day. Give him the last thoughts of the day. So before you go to sleep, take a moment and be still and thank him for his help throughout the day. You asked him to help, and he did. Thank him for it before you go to sleep. And then thank him that he promises to watch over you while you sleep and, and to keep you safe throughout the night. Thank him before you drift off to sleep. Uh, Psalm 121 verse 3, it says, he who keeps you will not slumber. He's never going to go to sleep on you. And and don't don't be upset, my friend, if if you're praying just before you go to sleep and you, act, you kind of fall asleep before you get finished praying, mid-sentence, I've done that a bunch. Well, don't let that bother you. What better way to drift off to sleep than in the arms of your Father? Wow. Learn to be intimate with God. Learn to live in unbroken fellowship and communion with Him. Pursue Him with all of your heart and you're gonna find him. Let me pray for you. My Father, I come to you in Jesus' name and I bring my friends with me. And Lord, this, this is the desire of your heart that we live before you and with you in unbroken fellowship and communion every minute of the day. And you promised that when we would pursue you with our whole heart, we would find you. I pray for my friend I pray that today will be the day they'll put their heart in their pursuit of you. They'll put their heart in their pursuit of you. Father, I thank you. Some of my friends don't know you. I pray that today will be the day they give their heart to you. Some of my friends, Lord, that are with us today, they're not where they need to be in right relationship with you, and they know it. No one has to tell them. They know it. God, pull on their heart today. Draw them back to you. Let this be the day. Let this be the day. And Father, some of my friends, they need a miracle. There's a sickness in their body. There's pain. They need a miracle. And I believe in miracles. I've seen you work too many to doubt it. So I'm going to ask on behalf of my friend, Father, I ask for your healing touch, your healing grace to move upon their body right now. My friend, in Jesus' name, be healed. Be healed. Father, thank you for listening. Thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you for speaking to our hearts as we've talked about how to be intimate continually in your presence. Do for my friend what they cannot do for themselves. Bless them in ways they never imagined possible. I thank you, Father. Meet them at the point of their need. Make a difference in their life today. I thank you for doing this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, my friend. 
Thank you for listening to this week's message. To stay up to date, please like us on Facebook at Touching Africa Ministries or visit our website at touchingafricaministries.org. If you would like to give online, head to touchingafricaministries.org slash donate.